I think one of the main things that keeps me going is the community, is knowing that I create spaces that bring people together. On the very surface level, people come together to have a good time and be able to enjoy things. And at the same time, even though that feels surface level, that's so needed. There's a need for that space because without that, without entertainment and without art, we don't have breath. I also know that this is like my purpose to do this. It's my purpose in this world to be someone that provides even just an ounce of liberation to someone, allow someone to be more free in themselves. If I can provide that and that's something that I know I can provide to people, that's what I do. Hi everyone, my name is Steven Wakabayashi and you're listening to Yellow Glitter, perspectives from queer Asian creatives and changemakers making an impact. This episode, we're joined by an extra special guest, Miss Shumai. Miss Shumai is a Taiwanese-American drag queen whose drag incorporates dance and humor to celebrate the queer Asian American experience. Originally from the Bay Area, she holds the title of Miss Gappa 2018 and now resides in Los Angeles where she helps run multiple queer Asian spaces, including LA's API drag extravaganza, Said Nudes Party. Let's get into it. Welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for having me. It's so great to have you, uh, another Taiwanese. My mom's also from Taiwan, so repping Taiwan. (laughs) Yeah, Taiwan. Yes. Have you been before? I used to go before pandemic every two to three years. Um, I love Taiwan. Oh, that's legit. Yeah. That's legit. Do you have a lot of family there? I do. My mom is actually uh, one of 13 brothers and sisters. Oh, so you, right. oh, so you know. Yeah. <laughs> so you know. I have a, I have a, my, my <laughs> mom's like side. Southern is, Taiwan. Yeah, my mom's side is really, really big as well. <laughs> yeah. Where is she from originally? So my diasporic background is a little interesting. So my parents both met. And basically grew up in Taiwan, but they're not, they weren't born there originally, even though, but they're both full Chinese. Um, My mom was born in Cambodia. So full Chinese, but Cambodian can't, we're both sides of my family are Cantonese. Oh, wow. Um, My dad was born in Guangzhou, Mm -hmm. then moved to Hong Kong super early and then moved to Taiwan for college. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then most of my dad's side is in Taiwan. So. Wow. Nice. Uh, near Taipei? Yeah, everyone's in Taipei. Yeah, yeah. And then when's the last time you visited? Nearly 10 years ago. Wow. Um, I know. It was, the year was 2015. And I had just graduated college. Oh, I just aged myself. <laughs> uh, I had just graduated college. And my parents were like, let's go visit your family. And I was like, bet. I'm not paying for this trip. <laughs> And so, yeah, that was the last time I was out of the country and it was my first time being there, like being out too. So that was an interesting experience, but because I was with family, I didn't really like get to, I didn't get to explore queer nightlife. Also, I was like, I was 21. I was, I felt really young. Mm. I felt it didn't feel super safe for me to like go out and about meeting. Who was I going to ask someone on Jacked, like to take me around? (laughs) So... (laughs) Oh, back in the day, I I think it's changed tremendously over the years and the gay nightlife scene, I think has really blossomed. But back in the day, I remember like, like back then, and it wasn't even that long ago, but just 10 years ago, I think it was still very like hush hush, Mm -hmm. not that many spaces. And overall, I think at that time, like Taiwan wasn't as developed as it is now either. Now, like it's actually expensive. Oh no! In some parts, yeah. Oh no! Like really, yeah, 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 yeah. But back in the day, I remember I would be able to go out with my mom, grab breakfast for like a few bucks. Now I think it's just like there's so much. Oh no! Yeah, but I'm sure the experience is also different for folks living there. I was also reading about the origins of your name. Oh. And a big part of it, I read, it was also giving homage and heritage to your Taiwanese roots as well, right? Yeah. So my drag name, Miss Shumai, when I first started drag, 
I didn't really have a drag name yet until I was preparing for my first performance when my name was supposed to be labeled onto a flyer in a sense. So I was just I was just kind of cross dressing for fun, you know, dabbling, exploring gender expression and mm -hmm. performing. Uh, once I had the opportunity to perform, my name had to be on a flyer. So I was like, Stephen, can I curse? Yeah. I was like, shit, fuck, I would need to be on my name's going to be on a flyer. I got to figure out a name. And so I had a, yeah, my original name is just like, it was like stupid based off of like my government name, you know, it was like that or that stupid thing that when it went around online where it's like your pet's name and then the street you lived on, yeah. you know, it was like variations oh, of <laughs> very uncreative things like that. Very unfunny. <laughs> and then, so I was like, this ain't it. This ain't it. I was in rehearsal with my backup dancers. Yeah. Um, as I had mentioned to you before, I am a choreographer and a dancer mm -hmm. before drag. And so I was like, well, if I'm going to do a performance, I'm going to give them what I know how to do, and which is a choreographed dance set. And so I was in rehearsal with my dancers. I was like, I still need to figure out a drag name. And this is like in between teaching. Like we had just like grabbed waters and I was like, I turned to one. I was like, I kind of want my name to be like kimchi because this is like right after season eight. Eight, I think yeah and like kimchi's name was like in the in the um zeitgeist if you will um I was like I kind of want my name to be like kimchi like a food item but that can also sound like a girl's name but my culture yeah and like I said uh, my bloodline is Cantonese and so dim sum originates from is a Cantonese cuisine yes. and so I was like what if my name yes. was shumai and then I had like a light bulb moment with one of my dancers and bam the rest is history mm. Is your favorite food uh, dim sum? You know, it became that way because of my namesake. But growing up, I was such a yeah. picky a motherfucker. And whenever, whenever really? we went to dim sum, I would ask for, you know, the... Uh, do you speak Mandarin, by the way? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, yeah. the, the xia chang fan, the, the rice noodle rolls. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, everyone, oh everyone loves, yeah. yeah when I was in <laughs> the tom when fun, I was the kid, rice roll, yeah. I was, I was, such, I was such a little bitch. I would ask them. I was. I would like throw a fit if my parents didn't order just the just the fun, just the noodles and the soy sauce. No shrimp. <laughs> yeah, for our listeners, it's a it's basically a sheet of rice, and then you just like roll it up. And I think, especially for kids, and why kids love it is it's chewy, it's simple, and you just season it however you want it. You want soy sauce on it, hoisin sauce for a little sweetness. And then I think when they get a little too advanced with the like layerings of all the stuff, mm -hmm. I think it just gets very complicated. But especially when I bring people who haven't had dim sum, mm -hmm. it's so funny. They love that. So it's like all the stuff that all the kids love, right. usually adults, right. like the first furry. And they're like, oh, yes. But shumai, do you like shumai? Shumai. Oh, yeah, I love it. I love it. I've made I've learned to make it a bunch of times. I have. There's wow. There's a YouTube video somewhere of me teaching people how to make it somewhere on YouTube yeah. during the pandemic. And uh, yeah, so I've made it a bunch of times. Um, it's honestly not that hard to make. You just you just shove meat in a wrapper and call it a day <laughs> um, and you steam it. It's just getting the filling texture right. And so, yeah, I feel like the starter dim sums are like uh, Hakao Sumai and yep. Cheng Fun, which is like, you know, I feel like those are your starters. Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Yeah. Back to going back to just being in drag and kind of your work. You also talked about being a dancer. And I'm just curious, what was kind of that repertoire before even going to drag? Like, what were you yeah. doing? What was that whole history? Yeah. So I started dancing late or early, depending on how you look at it. I started in high school mm -hmm. and I started um, as a studio kid. So you've seen Dance Moms. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was one of the I was one of those kids, but a late starter, so I wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. Um, and so what originally got me started in dance, I did not I did not excel in any extracurricular. I was a very stereotypical gay where you threw any ball towards my way, any contact sport my way, just failure. Last picked on everything, and so my uh yeah. dance was the first thing that really allowed me to like feel confident in myself, and it was something I just I. I knew how to copy and memorize moves well naturally, thankfully. And so I started doing hip hop, contemporary, jazz, ballet, and tap at my studio. So I've done all that. 
I danced through the choreography teams in college. I did comp competitions, all that. Um, for any listeners or, that are familiar with body rock, vibe, big co dance competitions like that, I've I've done them all. That's like the biggest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did a team called NSU Modern in college. And then after I joined Team Millennia, Team Millennia was featured on America's Best Dance Crew Season 2, I think. Oh, nice and so yeah, that was yeah. i mean obviously that was like way before i joined but yeah i was on that team for a little bit and with them that's when i did body rock which was super duper fun so after that i started teaching at local studios teaching both hip-hop jazz funk mm -hmm. um forayed into teaching heels which is mainly what i do now teaching heels technique for those of you who don't know yes that is now now a style because there is a very specific technique and styling that is involved in performing sexy and dancing in high heels. And so that is how where I am now as a dancer. I teach multiple classes weekly. I choreograph for different gigs, artists throughout. I've done a few music videos. I choreographed for one K-pop idol and I hope it is not the last. Oh, hi. That's awesome. And also to, for context too, in LA, back in the day, there was really not that much popularity for Asian folks going to dance too. And I feel like a lot of it was very white dominant. And yeah, I also got into dance like very, very, very late. And you a dancer too? Yeah, I danced back in the day. What yeah. the heck? I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Ballet and contemporary, and I was very oh. up in it. <laughs> oh, technique. She's a technique girl. Yes. Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, my TLDR is I tried to go professional and this was back in San Diego and that's where a lot of the dance uh -huh. mom kids mm -hmm. are you know and I just couldn't get gigs because people were like well you're Asian like I know and this was like 2010 yeah 2000 and you know you would audition for music videos and people were like well, we're not looking for ethnic, you know, <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? And there's just one occurrence with most humiliating. I went to an audition and then the, um, the director at the time was like, you know what, Steven, we like, we don't have a job for you here, but we're going to together brainstorm things you could audition for. And they're like, okay, well, is there like a musical for like a school, like high school? You could be like the nerd, you could be. And so it was about like 30 people in a room together ideating things I should be auditioning for instead. That's. And I was like, oh, no, honey. What? The racism. Oh, my God. That's crazy. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. Yeah. And it was just one of those things also coming out of needs. I couldn't get gigs. I was. Um, dancing at the gay bars. <laughs> like, it was not cute. You were a go-go? <laughs> I love it. As someone who, as a drag queen as who... As needs arise. I work with go-go's <laughs> all the time. I love it. I love it. <laughs> uh, and it's just one of those things that, you know, has since pivoted, but I do... I was between a rock and a hard place where it just, I was trying so hard and it was just not happening. And it was just one of those things that and sometimes I still take, you know, dance classes here in New York City. Technique is not there anymore. I'm not as flexible. It's just, it's, it's definitely a different place. But I always have a lot of admiration for especially Asian folks in the dance community. Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, that I hadn't had a specific experience like the one you had. I'm sorry. That is very fucked up <laughs> that that it's, happened to it's you. It's insane. That yeah. is absolutely <laughs> insane. Maybe you should go back to high school and be a nerd. The fuck? Okay. They're like, it's, a, it's you're going to be popular. There's going to be a lot of roles for you. I can't. That is, that's, just, that's stupid. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like my experience kind of echoes because I was really trying, after college, I was really, I was obviously very into the dancing and I really wanted to mm -hmm. go professional, professional being like, being signed with an agent, you know, being booked for music videos and stuff yeah, like that, which, yeah. you know, I still did without an agent. Mm -hmm. You don't need an agent mm -hmm. necessarily or to be, you don't need representation necessarily to be a successful dancer necessarily. Mm -hmm. It helps, but it's not necessary. And at the time when I was really into training and auditioning and whatnot, I think that I was at a point where one, it really felt like 
Yes, there were. Su- I was obviously maybe one of a few, like a handful of Asians at auditions. I wasn't the only one, but I was one of a handful. It was very sparse was during very sparse. that time. Yeah. 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 So this was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was like 2015, 16, that era, that time. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it was one sparse. Two, I think at the time I also had dance, obviously, when going professional, very gendered, mm-hmm. right? If you're a boy, it's expected that you dance very masculine. You have a certain type of build, even if like you're gay and do like jazz funk and like can do all the tour choreography. There's still a level of masculinity that is expected of you. Mm-hmm. And as mm-hmm. someone with with maybe one to two masculine bones in my body, I always felt like I was auditioning at like cosplaying something I'm not Mm, and trying to dance up to an expectation that I'm that like to someone that's inauthentic to myself. Yeah. Cause that's what teachers had told me to do in classes. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that's what the need was. That's how, like, I think nowadays it's a little bit more accepting. I went to a audition for a queer talent group. Yeah. When was this a few years ago? It might have been right before the pandemic, but there was a there was a heels audition category that was like open gender. And I was like, oh, slay. I love that. I attended didn't didn't make any cuts. It's fine. Mm. The only boys they took were people who could do both, who did both categories kind of a thing. So I get it, whatever marketability. But I think why. Yeah. Long story short, I kind of. I gave up auditioning because I was just like too tired of it. I was tired of kind of putting myself in boxes to try and like vie for a job in a sense. And Mm -hmm. that's kind of what at that point is how I found drag and drag kind of fell into my lap because it was not only a way for me to use dance as a way to celebrate my femininity. um, It was also a way to kind of create my own stardom. It was a way for me to Mm -hmm. tell my own stories while utilizing dance on top of utilizing other art forms and be able to celebrate my story, tell my experience in an interdisciplinary way. Hmm. Yeah. Same thing, right? Where it's almost out of necessity, right? But it becomes something that saved you in a way. Yeah. Allows you to create this work. What does drag mean to you? Ooh. After having done it for so many years, where are you now with it? Yeah. I mean, I think my answer with that kind of varies. I feel like for when you're really busy working at some points, drag. Mm-hmm. Drag means so many things to me. When you're burnt out, drag means a paycheck. (laughs) Unfortunately, right? Because like you said, out of necessity. But I think, you know, when talking about it like this, it reminds me of one, the reason why I do what I do. And it really, drag to me really means liberation and community building. It's being able to do numbers that really resonate with an audience member. And hopefully allow a sense of freedom and liberation in them by seeing what I do. Saying that you can do this too. You can be an a-, a queer Asian and celebrate your femininity, celebrate your sensuality, not in a way that is fetishized, but in a way that is fully embracing of you. Mm-hmm. So I guess, yeah, drag to me fee- means liberation. Mm. And do you have a particularly favorite moment? of whether you're performing or having done something that during that moment, it just reminded you like, um, I absolutely love what I'm doing, reminded you about the beauty and the creativity and... Yeah. Oh, it's hard to pick one exact moment. I think one thing that really stands out to me is, as you mentioned when introducing me, I am the co-producer and founder of Send Nudes Party, which is LA's longest running Mm -hmm. API drag show. We really try and make it an intentional space that celebrates queer and trans API folks, building together the queer API community and uplifting drag performers who don't have the opportunity to do numbers that are like celebrating their, their culture and being able to showcase that to an audience that'll get it. Um, because it's one thing to cater your number towards a general C white audience and do like a top 40 songs that's going to make money versus like, oh, I'm going to do a number that's like very specific to my culture. But someone, multiple people in the audience are going to get it and feel very seen by that. 
And so that is the space that we create. The intention is also that we create a home for our community. And we've had so many of our folks come up to us saying that they didn't think that out of going to a drag show, they would have a healing experience, that they would feel at home. And that this is one of the places where folks, even whether they are recently out, whether they're just new to LA and are, you know, are navigating both their identity and trying to find community. This is a place where we've had folks come and they get to meet new friends and create communities from our show. And so I think, I think that's one of my proudest moments is being able to create this for my community. And mm. hopefully we are, we are continuing to do so. No, I, I mean, that's a big deal. Just producing a show. I think sometimes people aren't even aware of even if a show is like what a, an hour or two hours long, it goes oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. multitudes of hours into preparation, right? You're sourcing the talent, making sure that they show up. Right? Yeah, you're booking music, uh, musicians, DJs for just like background entertainment, foreground entertainment, getting all your numbers rehearsed. I have a ton of friends who also do drag and um, the amount of work that goes into prepping just a three, five minute piece. Yeah. People aren't even aware. And I think it just shows so much commitment to the work, the the love of it, you know, and even just being able to perform and putting on face. I feel like the work leading up to it, people sometimes take for granted. And I have to just say for especially for listeners, it's so much work that goes into it and thus especially when you see drag performers, you got to tip them. <laughs> you got to mm-hmm. throw yeah. that cash everywhere. Um, and sometimes, uh, especially in working with venues, they don't pay the performers enough. And I think, especially with Drag Race, I think it's definitely helped to put drag on the map for many folks. But you'll be surprised, right? Where um, the RuPaul girls are paid 10, 100 X. Oh, yeah. Compared <laughs> to the city girls who actually are the lifeblood right. of all the cities right. that they contribute to. Right. Unfortunately, being a drag queen under capitalism is uh, hard, <laughs> but yeah. yeah. So to all of our listeners, support your local drag performers, not just your queens either. Mm-hmm. Don't just support the drag queens. There are, I, there's been some, I mean, it's an ever going conversation where drag kings don't get as much support and recognition as they deserve. So support your drag kings too. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you are a drag performer and you're producing a show and there are, are only queens in the show, you might want to think twice. Yeah. Yeah. Working with venues is um, when it works, it works. But when it's a pain, it's it's such a pain. A lot more. Most of my like higher paying gigs aren't in nightlife that I've had. The nightlife gigs are the ones that are more consistent mm. because obviously yep. like, you know, people go out. And that's where there's a demand. But yeah. the more higher paying gigs have been like the one off things I do for like big events, corporations, et cetera. So uh, I'm not too entirely tapped into the L.A. scene more so here in New York City. But I'm just curious, how has it been over the years? How has it evolved since you've been yeah, creating spaces, bringing communities together? What have you been seeing? Well, I think that. We found Send Nudes because we were tired of being token, like the token Asian in every single cast, right? Mm. And so I think that us being one of the first, we're now not the only, thank God, only like queer Asian night event. I say night because we're not, my show is not always at night. Currently, we are doing a drag dim sum at Chifa a Chinese Peruvian restaurant in Eagle Rock. That's awesome. And yeah, it's really, really cool. And we sell out every time. So if you're listening to this, um, be sure to follow and get some tickets because we sell out fast. (laughs) So yeah, uh, we've been doing brunch more recently, but uh, we're not the only ones. But at the time, Mm -hmm. it really felt so important for us to exist because it's just so much, it feels so much more at home when you're within community. Yeah. Versus when you're at a gig with like, you know, just uh, it not to say that I don't enjoy doing those gigs. Obviously, I love performing in all types of shows, but there's something very special about performing for your community, your chosen family, 
et cetera, et cetera. So Mm -hmm. how the drag scene has kind of changed, like I said, there's now more queer API spaces, which is great. Mm -hmm. I think that after the pandemic, there has been a birth of more drag performers too, because lots of people had had a lot of time inside to explore. (laughs) Yeah, we had a lot. We we've we've had a lot more talent, a lot more shows. But also because of that, I think working with venues has been a little bit more difficult because there have been a lot of venues closing down. Business may or may not have been very, very great. And so it's like, yeah, great because there's so much drag. But I feel like in LA, I was talking to my friend, uh, Rock, Rockham Sakura from Drag Race. Mm-hmm. Uh, she mentioned to me that doing drag in LA kind of feels like you're doing drag to get a bag. Mm. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah. No wonder I'm so burnt out because I feel because she is from SF. She did drag a lot in San Francisco. And I think yeah. there, what, how she explained it was that there were, it felt a lot more artistically fulfilling in a sense mm. versus here. It's like, do a good number, get a lot of, get a lot of money and then look fabulous. And, you know, that's it. And so not to say that there aren't performers that are like pushing boundaries and doing some really, really cool shit here. There are obviously that, but yeah. the environment has not been as conducive to, you know, putting together. And this also might be because I've been in the game for a while now. I th- I started drag back in 2016, mm-hmm. more doing more performances in like 2017. So it's been, you know, a good amount of time. I think mm-hmm. there's also like that, that puberty you get when you first start and get good at a skill mm-hmm. where you where you, there's so much energy that and and velocity yeah maybe it's because i've been in this for a while that i don't feel i, I feel a little bit more burnt out from it from like really really pushing and mm. coming up with some cool shit not that i not that i don't come up with cool shit nowadays it just feels like i had yeah i was bursting at the scenes with things i wanted to do without like necessarily the yeah. experience and skill set and resources now it's the opposite. <laughs> I have the skill set, the resources and experience, but not the energy. <laughs> mm. I mean, you're coming up on almost 10 years. If you think about it. For real? Oh, oh my right. God. Did you say it like that? <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. It's almost your Shoot, my turn is eight this year. <laughs> yeah. Growing up so fast. My forehead just started sweating. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Jesus. But you know, I I have to say <laughs> thank God for handheld fans. <laughs> it's oh lot. girl, if you don't if you don't have a handheld fan. <laughs> I would like to give the audience a pro tip. I'm currently holding a black handheld fan. This is how I get my eyelashes to dry in the correct place. Yeah. I don't know how to put on eyelashes without this. So <laughs> No, it's the best thing. Oh, yeah. Especially when it's hot and you're just melting. And you can only wave a handheld fan so long, like the clickety-clack ones. Mm -mm. But the electronic ones that just USB charge, Mm -hmm. game changer. They are. I want a stronger one. I feel like there's a stronger one on the market than the one I have. Well, now you see the ones that are necklaces and they just put it on their neck. Have you seen that? And it just shoots the air up. I bought that. And then I tried wearing it. And then I forgot I wear it while I'm in drag and I have hair that gets caught in the fit. <laughs> so I, I feel okay, like I would need like good. the blades, those the <laughs> like the bladeless ones. That's just like a hole yeah, that yeah, blows yeah. out. A hole that blows out. That's not myself. Um, <laughs> yeah, I've seen drag queens with that, like wearing that around. Um, yeah. But yeah, drag is not a summer sport. Yeah. It's now starting to get warm in LA. <laughs> and I'm glad to not be freezing freezing like i'm in like i freeze in la yeah but like (laughs) 50s (laughs) what like that's not crazy cold but it's cold in la uh, yeah it's la cold it's different it's different but yeah now it's about to get warm and i'm i'm about to be sweating my entire face off yeah i'm curious as especially you're doing work and getting involved in the community and you just mentioned you know there's this giant influx of drag queens And I'm sure we have some listeners also starting to dabble in it. I'm curious if you have any advice for Mm -hmm. maybe folks just starting to dip in, but also thinking about how do I get involved in the community and be a part, a contributing member as a part of this larger drag community? 
Do you have any thoughts? Do you have any tips, yeah. advice? I think if there's one thing I always tell folks when they're first starting in drag and what helped me is just really nerd out about it. I feel like with Drag Race being like now the gold standard of drag, right? Yes, it's elevated what drag can be, which is incredible and elevated what the art can be. There's also just like the girls are taking out loans to be on the show to pull these like incredible looks, right? You don't need to do that when you're first mm -hmm. starting out. Mm -hmm. The one thing in any kind of art form you can do to really shoot yourself in the foot is put too much pressure on yourself to be good. Perfect, right? You, you, you gotta mm -hmm. be crunchy before you can get cunty, okay? I was very crunchy when I first started mm -hmm. and you all have to be crunchy, embrace the crunchy, nerd out about it and keep practicing and keep practicing what interests you about the art from drag. Mm -hmm. Maybe it is the makeup. That's what, that's what got me into it because I got really, really interested in, in makeup. Instead of brushing my teeth, I would brush half my teeth, walk out of the room with half my face contoured. You know, like it, I would just, <laughs> I would just end up practicing makeup just because, yeah. you know, the bug took me over. Let the bug take you over, not COVID. The, let the, mm. let the interest take you over. <laughs> if it's sewing, if it's wig styling, yeah. if it's dancing, mm -hmm. if it's, uh, you know, if it's just performing, you know, whatever it is, let that bug take you over in terms of like how to get involved. Go to your local shows, go to, oh, mm -hmm. I think that one of, this might be a little, I mean, it's not necessarily dated per se, but it is helpful, especially when you're first starting out, go out to shows, go in drag to shows. So that way, one, meet the host, meet the producers. As a host myself, if someone comes to my show in drag, I'm always ha very, very happy to meet them, especially, and this is biased because I produce an API drag show. If you, mm -hmm. if you, if you identify as that, I love to meet you, you know, and especially because my show, I very much so want it to be a place for people to debut their performances. Right. And because, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it would be, it's so special to be able to debut your art form to, you know, your own yeah. community. Right. So yeah. I would love to meet you and any producer, unless they're really stingy hoity toity, mm -hmm. they would also love to meet other performers too. Don't be shy. Let them know that you're new to drag and you would love to start performing. Mm -hmm. If they don't want you for their show, that's fine. They'll probably be able to tell you who they are. Start following, make a drag Instagram, follow other drag performers. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Instagram is super millennial of me to say, but it, the, I think it's a still a good way that I, I connect and book things with people. So yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So make an Instagram, get your content out there. Um, even if it's just photos, reels of you posing, doing a pandemic style performance at home, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. put your stuff out there. Don't be shy. Yeah. I, you gave a whole business 101, <laughs> the uh, crash course for drag. And I guess what Our I Venmo also is at Miss Jumai. Yes. <laughs> Drag 101 masterclass, you heard it here. <laughs> My takeaway from what I what really resonated was you got to start somewhere and just get out there. And that art is also so, so subjective, you know? Oh, yeah. And I feel like sometimes with RuPaul and all the girls there, I mean, a big critique, right, is it's all fitting this right. type of drag, whereas drag is like the whole spectrum, you know? Right. And I think sometimes we forget that art is so much of what you want to bring into the world. It could be something that you think is missing, you know? And I love, especially nowadays, people are truly embracing their culture as a part of drag. Yes. And bringing it forth in the shape that they want it to come up yeah. And I think that's what this with a lot of creative careers, you know, oftentimes I think what holds us back from being truly creative, I find is perfectionism. Mm -hmm. Do you struggle with perfectionism? I'm a Virgo. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, All the Virgos. <laughs> I'm a Virgo. What do you think? And that's why I know best in saying that these are battles that I, I'm constantly fighting and sometimes losing at. Yeah. But at the same time, 
I know that it's okay to be bad. And I'm, I think for me also as an artist who, you know, yeah. drag and dance are not only my lifeblood, they're also my, mm -hmm. what's the word I'm looking for? It's uh, my, my, my means of source of, source of income. And <laughs> oh, <yeah>. that too. <laughs> um, but yes, when I will say that for me personally, when your art also becomes your job, your relationship to it kind of changes. Because mm -hmm. if someone has ever told you, do something you love and you'll never have to work a day in your life, that's bullshit. We all live under capitalism. Yeah, yep, We all yep. need to survive in this shit, you know? So that's bullshit. Yeah. If you're an artist and you do work, you deserve to be compensated for your work and your experience, mm -hmm. period. And guess what? If you're getting paid for it, it's work. It doesn't matter. If you love it, that's a bonus, mm -hmm. right? And so, yes, of course, I love what I do. I think also for me, I've been trying to dabble into other creative mediums in order to come burn out. And so, mm. like, I started learning how to draw recently and mm. shit's crunchy and that I'm learning to be OK with that. And, you know, follow the bug when the inspiration hits, follow the inspiration bugs when they hit. Um, I also, you know, I dabbled in voice acting. I dabbled in singing, Stream Luckier, my my Lunar New Year single wow. um, on Spotify. Don't have that high expectations. We'll put the link in the show notes. <laughs> but the music video <laughs> and the dance practice are also out on YouTube. Oh, that's awesome. So, yeah, like I dabbled in a bunch of other things. And so I think because yeah. I've done, I've done, I've put myself in so many new artistic situations mm -hmm. Be, the fear of being of not being perfect you know I'm, i can fight it faster mm -hmm. you can fight it faster once you do it enough mm, trying new things right yeah 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 it's scary but it's worth it on the other side because fear and excitement are the same coin but different size oh i love i love that frame too yeah um that Sometimes physiologically, it's the same thing, really. It's an interpretation of it. Exactly. Exactly. Your heart goes boom, boom. Your pit starts sweating. And you're like, oh, God, what's going to happen? Or you could be like, oh, God, what's going to happen? So they're the they're same, same parts. The same parts. <laughs> I love that. And I feel like especially when we layer in different identities that are especially marginalized, subjugated here in the West in our instance, right? The more we are put on a pedestal to be perfect, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Being queer, being Asian, especially in the Asian community, I feel like there's no room for gay or straight. <laughs> you better not mess up, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think in, the ent in entertainment, there's like, you know, I think how we know we have made it is that when we can celebrate our mediocrity is something I've heard in the zeitgeist. You know, there's obviously, yes, support Asian excellence, support uh, POC excellence, support Black excellence. Yeah. But we know we made it when, you know, because the white folks can be mediocre and they're great. And like they can make a, they can make a big, mm -hmm. they can make a big buck and get all these accolades. But we can't do the same. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, there's so much unpacked there. But it's, I especially when you see like, white folks on social media like they're like oh we're such a bad graphic designer and everyone laughs i'm like right but how do you know they're good <laughs> like how do you know this isn't the epitome of their work <laughs> like what's the joke is the joke aha this like this is so crunchy it must not be them and i'm like no there's a lot to unpack here you know like i don't think anyone who isn't white can easily do something like a terrible job, right? And people think it's humor. Right. They just brandish you as just being untalented. And right. I, I, I find that also the tough part with also, I, I love your frame about championing mediocrity for our own community because it's not as crunchy as it sounds where, you know, I think excellence, we're also then put on this ladder where unless you're excellent, and making millions and millions, you're also worthless. When in fact, right. you should be able to do anything to whatever degree and enjoy it, survive off of it. Um, and sometimes we, I, I love that reframe where it's just like the crunchiness is so important too. Yeah. Captain Crunch. Exactly. Eat it up. Burn, <laughs> destroy the roof of your mouth. Eat it up. 
<laughs> it does. I'm curious, um, especially in the work that you do with your show and your community, what has that done for you personally? Ooh. What has it brought you? Yeah. I think, I mean, drag has really, drag has really given me purpose, I feel, because like there, there's that one chart that's been that goes around on the internet here and there where it's like something that makes you money something you love to do and something that helps others and in that intersection ikigai, ikigai yes. yes you speak japanese too right yes i do i do too i just studied it in high school oh yeah i have family in yokohama as well oh nice yeah oh, that's awesome yeah when i grew up in la uh my father put me through asahi gakuen which is like a Saturday magnet school for Japanese kids where I've never talked about this on podcast, but you go off on a Saturday and this is for Japanese businessmen traveling or the ones in LA that are like, you have to be Japanese. You're there from literally 8 a.m. until like 5, 6 p.m. And they teach you grammar, uh, history, math, science, all the subjects all in Japanese. And you're not allowed to speak oh, English on school campus and then you get like written up <gasps> if I know it was so Japanese like like it's still there which is good but it's a little traumatic right. like <laughs> I I yeah you got you had an extra day of school and it was like militant yeah. it sounds like <laughs> yeah and then I remember my mom when she signed me up for a Chinese school on Sunday I was a kid, like six, seven at the time. I literally had a like a mental breakdown. So I started much. crying. I was like, I can't do this. Because then, you know, they all they give you homework on like the Saturday school right. for the next Saturday. Yeah. And then Chinese school gives you homework for the subsequent Sunday. And I was literally like, when am I going to do homework? Like when? Right. That's so much to put on a kid. And then my mom, after two weeks, she's like, okay, you're good. Uh, <laughs> like no Chinese school. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Did your parents put you through school? I did. I went through Saturday Chinese. I did a Saturday weekend Chinese school uh, that I threw a fit and quit after six years of doing it. Yeah. I mean, that's still you troop through the bulk of it. Right. And I think, I mean, my literacy in Mandarin is like not great whatsoever because obviously I quit. Yeah. But I, I think I can speak it pretty well. I live in um, basically Arcadia right now. So like I oh. I use my Mandarin very often to speak with yeah. anyone who is working in this area. And so I, I think I'd speak pretty. I speak OK. It's not bad. I speak I speak fluent ABC is what I say. Yeah. <laughs> Say, say, when I go to Taiwan, it's like <laughs> English words that I'm like, I don't think they understand, but this is, this is how it's just going to go down. Right, right, right. Yeah. And did you, did you grow up in the area? No, 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 no. I actually, I'm, I'm from the Bay Area. So I grew up in Fremont, uh -huh. which is a city that is as Asian as the 626. So moving here feels like I'm at home, but in L.A. So that's why I moved here, one, because I obviously wanted to be around my people. But more importantly, two, I moved here during, like after the, yeah. not after the pandemic. I hate, I hate the term post-pandemic because guess what? I still have a job with the COVID department of, in the public health. So it's not gone. It's not gone. I still have a job. Mm. Yes, but like, especially with the rise in Asian hate crimes because of COVID and rise in LGBT yeah. hate crimes, right? Yeah. I was I was living in like LA proper and I was like the only queer and only Asian in my neighborhood and I felt very targeted a lot of the time. So to the point where I would drive to Alhambra from Culver City to grocery shop and I was like, why don't I just move here? So I did. Mm, yeah, it's a it's definitely a beautiful Asian Mecca. Oh, yeah. And it just expanded over time. I feel like literally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it here. <laughs> <laughs> what keeps you going? What keeps you inspired? What keeps you in it? I think one of the main things that keeps me going is the community, mm -hmm. is knowing that I create spaces that bring people together. On like the very surface level, people come together to like have a good time and be able to like mm -hmm. enjoy things. And at the same time, even though that feels surface level, that's so needed. Mm -hmm. There's a need for that space because without that, without entertainment and without art, we don't have breath. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps a lot of our livelihood and makes life worth 
living in a sense, right? Is that we get spaces to connect with our community. We get to see things that move us and make us feel, right? It's necessary. And so I think not only do I get to create spaces and make people feel, I also know that this is like my purpose to do this. It's my purpose in this world to Mm -hmm. be someone that provides even just an ounce of liberation to someone allow someone to be more free in themselves. If I can provide that, and that's something that I know I can provide to people, that's what I do. Yeah, And that's who I am everywhere that I step in life. As a dance teacher, I make sure that you're in a space where you're able to celebrate your body. And if you walk out of the room, knowing that you felt just a little bit more free in your body to celebrate your femininity and sensuality, you did your job. If you leave one of my shows, having felt more lightness, more having laughed, having Mm. been moved by me performing or by any of the performances, then I did my job. Mm -hmm. That that's what really keeps me going is that this is something that I provide to the world. There's no other way I know of myself to be. There's nothing sure uh, that I've ever known of myself that I'm put on this world to do. I love that. What is liberation then look like for you or the future of liberation? What does that look like for you? I mean, I think the future of liberation is, I think, especially right now, when we talk about liberation, we, we have to talk about those most marginalized, right? My liberation does not exist without the liberation of Palestine, Congo, Sudan, and it does not exist without the liberation of all marginalized communities all around the world, right? It's it's not just race. It's not just queerness. It's very, it's all intersectional. Mm-hmm. So what does liberation mean to me is like, that's a hard question to answer because I think right now we're really seeing so much bad shit happening that we, if we it feels like we can only do so much, right? Mm-hmm. There's liberation of peoples all over. There's liberation in self, in being able to unlearn the ways that we disallow celebration and the ways that we disallow authenticity to shine through. Mm. It's unlearning the ways we dull the shine and the light that we have because every single one of us are stars. Mm. And that's something that I truly believe. And we all have the capacity to be that in whatever capacity we choose. So that's what liberation means like to me. It means a lot of things that are both macro, across communities, international, as well as interpersonal. It's, it's, uh, we're all together, you know, and I, I really appreciate your very optimistic view as well. And I'm just curious, especially in dealing with these topics, which can feel really heavy, right? And so heavy. also with the rise of doom scrolling and existential dread is what they're calling it, where it's just like, you're spiraling, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm curious, one, have you always carried a sense of optimism with yourself throughout this work? And two, especially in navigating this work and continue to do it, how have you been able to keep yourself with a a level head to stay going through this work? Yeah. I think community is really important. Mm-hmm. I think for me, what keeps me level, not in a way where it's like pushing the emotions down in a sense, but knowing that mm-hmm. I'm there for and there with my community and that these are mm. these are things that we collectively feel together. There's so much there's healing and collective feeling. Mm-hmm. And so I think that knowing that has really kept me level headed, knowing that Mm -hmm. I don't like putting community leader as like a label on myself, but, you know, I do organize a lot of community spaces. And I think knowing that the people who come to our shows are people who also do great work in the community as well. And we provide a space Mm -hmm. for them as well. We provide a space for folks to share their platforms and, you know, to galvanize folks to take actions for the greater good as well. And I think Mm -hmm. it's hard. It's also very important that one, yes, community is important. It's important to get out there in community. It's also very important for one to acknowledge hurt and acknowledge feeling and not to push past 
because mm-hmm. to push past implies like you are skipping over a feeling that should have happened. Mm-hmm. And I always think that the only way out of an emotion is through. And so if you have to cry and you have to, if you have to doom scroll, mm. doom scroll. If you have to be in your dread, be in your dread. But I'll say mm. those that will pass, try not to stay there that long. I love that. That's very Virgo. Is it? Fuck. Just go through <laughs> it. Just get. Just <laughs> I'm like, but there, there really is no way yeah. out, but going through that emotion and allowing yourself to feel the emotion. Yeah. Like none of us are workhorses. None of us have to be on 100%. Yeah. Like, and it's okay to rest and take breaks as much as you can because capitalism drains us. And, you know, we all have, yeah. we all have mana. We all have mm-hmm. a finite amount of resources and energy and capacity. If your mana is low, you got to refill your mana in the way that you can. Yeah. If your ult is on cooldown, it's on cooldown. You can't do shit about that, but but but, mm-hmm. but put some black emblems and have some cooldown reduction items, you know? <laughs> yes. I'm curious. Um, well, I want to just uh, highlight, I think what I'm also taking away is being honest and being open about it without judgment yes and i think a big part of what you're saying right where you're pushing it down is also this sense of you have to be somewhere you have to feel something else and right i really love that authentic perspective of your own emotion as a way to process yeah yeah you have to be honest with your own emotions to be able to deal with them right it's a scary thing to do also, you know, it's a scary thing to, mm-hmm. and also sometimes you're not ready to feel the weight and the reality of things. And that's okay too. And that's okay too. And that can be in regards to mm-hmm. the shit that America is doing. It could be in regards to, you know, all the struggles and the war crimes that are, attra- the, and the atrocities happening across the world. It could also be mm-hmm. the feelings that you have as you go through your day-to-day, as you are unlearning and unpacking the layers to what becomes authentically you, be it yeah. internalized racism, be it internalized femphobia, homophobia, et cetera. Mm-hmm. You know, we are all constantly unlearning those things. And so yeah, it's important to be honest and gentle with yourselves. Yeah, definitely. How has your relationship with your identity and culture evolved while doing this work? I think that drag has been one of the biggest ways for me to play and explore and discover gender identity, gender expression, and be more at home in my body. Yeah. yeah. As well as a way to connect with my culture. I don't think I've been, I've never been as Asian as I am until I found Shumai, like I think, and it's, I, I speak with this knowing that I come from a place of privilege, knowing that I grew up in Fremont. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a high school where like most of my friends were Asian. And so like, I, I speak from a place of privilege, you know, not, I wasn't necessarily always shamed for being Asian. Mm. And, but at the same time, assimilation is still a thing. Mm-hmm. hating yourself for being Asian is still a thing, right? Even even when you're surrounded by, like, so many Asians, which, like, you know, mm-hmm. for, like, I have deep set in forehead. They're not that deep, but I have forehead lines because I thought my eyes were too, like, Asian-looking and small, so I would constantly go like this when I was a kid. Mm. You know, that's just one way that it kind of manifested. As it, that plays with queerness... Right. I think that Mm -hmm. being queer specifically from an Asian American experience, it's also really, really difficult because that kind of thing is not very talked about often. I'm glad things are a little bit better now, but it's still back when I was, it kind of feels like you can't be Asian and queer at the same time. I mean, obviously, yes, you can, but it's like, it feels like how do these make peace? Mm -hmm. How do these identities make peace with each other in a sense? And that's kind of what Mm. drag had really allowed me to do was to celebrate my queerness and Asian-ness in the same breath. Mm. I think the biggest thing for me and my favorite thing to do with my drag is to be able to celebrate cultural holidays in a queer way, Mm -hmm. which is how I have become the Lunar New Year Queen of Los Angeles, as people have said, people have said, 
my drag one of my sisters uh kylie mooncakes in seattle she said that i'm like mariah carey but for lunar new year's <laughs> which is like so stupid <laughs> um but very funny that's funny yeah yeah i think i think for me it's like when coming out to my parents one of the things that they said to me was mm -hmm. well one it was difficult they didn't accept it at first mm -hmm. one of the things that really that stuck out to me that my mom told me in that conversation when i came out to them was that like you know you shouldn't tell your extended family about this but she should don't tell your uncle mm. and so that really made me feel like okay i can't i can't be myself at home i can't be queer at home mm. how do i show up at like you know lunar new year family holidays and stuff like that and so mm. that's why being able to do like queer Lunar New Year parties, I think that's really, really meaningful to be able to do that because it's not, yes, you can go and have hot pot with your family, but then if you're able to, you're able to celebrate with your chosen family and be able to celebrate these mm. holidays that embrace your culture mm. while also being able to be truly yourself and step into your queerness, right? And so... Hmm. I think that's one of my, one of the ways in which my drag celebrates my queerness and Asian American experience in the same breath. Not everyone's Asian American experience looks the same. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone's, you know, some people might have a little bit more harder time celebrating these holidays, which is also valid, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that there's a lot of power in being able to celebrate your own experience and your own authenticity and in a sense drag allows me to kind of heal that inner child and do things that i always wanted to do and celebrate myself in a way that i never knew i needed but i always wanted to do mm -hmm. in a sense shumai became the role model that i always wanted to have when i was a kid that's beautiful miss shumai is saving you practically yeah. yeah she did she did she kills me sometimes too but she does save me sometimes it's a fraught relationship <laughs> yeah i don't know if you feel similarly but i think growing up without a lot of media representation as well as and as a queer person not a queer especially even queer asian yeah. queer, queer asians my role models were cartoon characters because mm. those were the only people that were either Asian and or Asian coded growing up. Yeah. And I remember going up like. Who were some of them? So Sailor Moon was definitely like. Yeah. Sailor Moon made me queer. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people can share a very similar sentiments. Yeah. Sailor Moon made me queer. Okay. Dragon Ball Z made me gay. And I hate them for that. Because now I have such an unrealistic expectation for. <laughs> for. <laughs> Because if, if you're not built like Goku, don't talk. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. I'm kidding. But like, <laughs> literally, my mouse pad is like like Majin Buu titties. Oh, <laughs> this is from the artist That's Jeremy Velasco. This is from Jeremy Velasco, based in LA. Um, another local queer Asian artist. It's amazing. Like, if Dragon Ball Z made me gay, Sailor Moon made me queer. Mm -hmm. And so I think that. I think someone who encapsulates their authenticity, their power, their softness, their grace and beauty all in one breath mm. is kind of what I wanted to be while also embracing their imperfection, embracing their humor because Sailor Moon always got was the butt of the joke, right? Like she was always the butt of the joke. She was always like the, yeah. she was all imperfectly perfect in a sense. And so that's, yeah. I think for me, Drag, Shumai isn't like an alter ego for me per se. I think a lot of folks think that drag is like another person mm -hmm. and just like you're someone different. That's, yes, I'm someone I'm different in drag. I feel like for me, it's like, yes, I had transformed into my Sailor Moon version self or I mega evolved or I turned Super Saiyan. It's a temporary form that is just like, yeah. I'm just on, you know, like my, my. It's like my, your elevated self. Exactly. It's like your like accentuate itself exactly like i got a boost to my my magic attack my attack speed you know i'm <laughs> yeah. like i'm more confident and louder and i carry my energy differently but mm. i'm the same person mm -hmm. and you know it's disingenuous to think of me as two different people right mm -hmm. I'm not a, i'm not a gemini i don't have any gemini placements so <laughs> i'm just kidding i love you I love you gemini's <laughs> or scorpio <laughs> oh is that scorpio shade right there i love it <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm just kidding. I love my Scorpios. Yes. Yeah, we love them. We love them all. <laughs> all of them. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> all facets of them. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's that's beautiful. I, I love the way you articulated that. And just going back to, you mentioned a little bit about your family. Yeah. What was the relationship with that now? It is good now. It is really good now. And I will say that when I first came out to them as gay, it was a spur of the moment decision for me. Mm -hmm. The conversation did not go really, really well. They were both very, very shocked. It came out of left field mm -hmm. um, because Asian immigrant parents, you know, you might think they're you might think they're smart and know things, but you know, the denial and the homophobia runs really, really deep. And mm -hmm. to this day, I'll, I'll like jokingly ask my mom because we're cool like that now that I'm like, where I'll be like, you really had no idea. And she was like, no, I really didn't. And I'm like, girl, mm -hmm. I was obsessed with Lady Gaga and made you watch Glee with me. What the hell did you think? <laughs> but like, you know, they don't know. Yeah, they don't know these kinds of things. So. So it was really, really hard. My dad had the harder time accepting it. It wasn't until like, mm. he, like for a lot, like apparently he had been like, he would like cry himself to sleep. Wow. Didn't never told me. I, my, I found, I found out from my mom like years after like he had kind of felt better about it, but apparently he would like, you know, be really, he would, this really, really hurt him. Yeah. And I, you know, that could have driven a big rift in my relationship with them. But mm. surprisingly, the champion for me was my aunt in Hong Kong, who mm. like my dad went to for advice. And basically she was <laughs> the one that was like, you know, your son only has one life. He's going to be how he's going to be. You don't get to choose that. Right. And so that, I think that was the wake up call. And I'm like, like I haven't, I ain't even talked to her in that long, but she did all this. That's, that's crazy. She's a cool mm. aunt. She's a real cool aunt. She's so funny. Aunt came through. Yeah. You know, yeah. Shaguma came through. It was great. Mm -hmm. Since then, I also, and I attribute my ability to be able to talk to them about queerness and queer identities to them from a very calm, patient and collected manner. Mm. I attribute that to my professional experience. Uh, working is as a professional gay and LGBT nonprofit. Mm. One of my responsibilities was doing like LGBT competency trainings tour for companies, healthcare providers, et cetera, et cetera. And so wow, yeah. with those facilitation skills, you go into that mindset kind of a lot of explaining, it's hard because when you're explaining your identity and your community's identities to immigrant parents who have all this, yeah. all this like bullshit that has, you know, that they've believed mm -hmm. one way has to be one way and they believe what they believe that's been told to them and they've been taught their whole lives. It's hard to unpack that and they have to come with you with their biases mm -hmm. and it can feel so much like it's an attack directly on you, mm -hmm. but it's not. It is just what they've been taught and they're doing what all they know with what they have. Mm -hmm. And so knowing that it's really hard, you really have to like take a, like a sharp breath before mm. like you be like, you be like, well, let's unpack that. No, that's not correct. Kind of a thing. And so yeah. with that, with that patience and it's, it was a lot of hard conversations. I was able to explain and I think they kind of get what, mm. what being non-binary and being queer means what being trans means that trans mm. is not like the does is not like the final step in gay ascension you know <laughs> i mean kind of interesting yeah i mean yeah, yeah. like they thought they thought that like yeah. the ultimate gay was being trans and i'm like mm. i mean no, no it's not like that yeah. i'm like it it's not quite like that no <laughs> but like you know so it's like Everyone has their own journey and has their own identities and has yeah. is can explore their own experiences and gender and sexuality are not one and the same. They can intertwine, but it's not one and the same. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that for me, especially as someone who started doing drag, they obviously were not happy about it, too, because obviously I was cross dressing. Yeah. I did not. Not only did I have to be gay and work in a nonprofit, I also became a cross dresser. <laughs> Yeah. Asian parents worst <laughs> yeah. nightmare, but I told them that hey, I'm they they pay me to do this. 
Mm-hmm. And then they were okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> then the Asian part is like, how much? <laughs> exactly, exactly. I told them like, oh yeah, for this number they paid for for one number they paid me a hundred, and they were like, that's it. And I was like, you know what? You're right. I should be paid much more. <laughs> <laughs> like come backwards way of like know. knowing your worth and right. getting your worth exactly and so now i think one yeah. of the most like i haven't talked about this in a while so i think the memory is now going to like move a lot some emotions that had just been stagnant for a while but yeah yeah i had like i was competing in a pageant called the gappa called gappa runway mm-hmm. it was a queer asian pageant specifically celebrating folks who the people can be or folks who are doing stuff, doing work to for the LGBT community, Mm -hmm. a lot of it. And so I competed in the drag portion of this pageant and preparing for this pageant. This was based in the Bay Area. So I was at home for a few weeks to do this pageant. And this is like still my first few years of drag. So a lot of my a lot of my shit was crunchy. It was great, but crunchy. Uh, one of my numbers, I was doing a number talking, speaking out about Asian fetishization. At that time, I had been really feeling the effects of it and had like a lot of interactions that really brought that to the forefront for me. And what better audience to do that than in San Francisco to all these white boyfriends of Asians, right? And so I <laughs> did, I made a box out of takeout or I made uh, I made a dress out of takeout boxes Mm -hmm. like just stapled together basically Mm. Um, at one point I was preparing and like I just needed an extra hand and I was like I I came out to my parents who like were watching their Chinese soap operas right and I was like mom can you help me hold this while I staple this and then we were struggling with it and at that at, at that point my dad like just hit pause on the tv and like both of them were like holding together my dress stapling together my dress to like like get it on me and it was just like it's kind of beautiful it was yeah. a ridiculously beautiful moment that really felt like wow they're supporting and really helping me even after all we've been through mm. they came to watch me at this pageant too and it was their first time seeing me in drag seeing me what? perform yeah. in drag and so what was that like what was it Having them there was really, was really just like a testament to how far our relationship had come. Mm. Cause I mean, not only with the queerness, like there was a big period of time where I pushed my family away. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, even though like, as like the baby of the family, not only like, yes, they treated me different. I felt like there was, they put me a lot of pressure on me. Yeah. There was a little, there was a bit of abuse from a family member who's no longer a family member because he's divorced that motherfucker. Man. But like, there was a lot of abuse that happened from him to me that really put a rift between me and my whole family there. I never felt mm. like anything I did was good enough for them. And I put a lot of resent on them. And yeah, I drove a rift between my family and that was some shit that I had to work on with them. Yeah. And I did. I did the work. I I owned up to my grievances, but I also was honest in the ways that they hurt me as well. Yeah, yeah. So them being there was kind of a testament to how far our relationship had come, moving and transforming our relationship in so many different ways. Mm. Through not only the distance, the the homophobia, yeah. the coming out, like all that journey, that felt like a culmination. Them being there felt like a culmination of all that. And so honestly, them being there was enough. That was a victory for me. Mm. The sash and the crown you see back here, that was the icing on the cake. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a big deal. That's a it, re- huge it was. Deal. Yeah. Yeah. And to this day now, they're very supportive. My mom will like comment on like my Instagram like photos and stuff like that being like wow so gorgeously beautiful and stuff like that yeah yeah she like gave me one of her bracelets to wear during the pageant and stuff too she'll That's she's like beautiful she's like a- always buying me like things for makeup and stuff now so yeah you know the the way our relationship transformed is like it was not easy and i also acknowledge that this is like something that it felt impossible for me for the longest time mm. but it happened I will say my parents are a little bit cooler than your very traditional Asian parents. I feel like they're a tiny bit more accepting and cool in general. Like 
yes, they put me through piano and put me through like like SAC rap and Kumon, all that stuff. Yeah. But at the same time, they also were just like in general a tiny bit more accepting than your average. And so But it took work to get there. It took work. It took a lot of work. Mm-hmm. And so I'm not saying if I can do it, you can do it. I'm so, but I'm saying that it's possible it was possible for me mm. and the possibility is there for anyone who's listening. Yeah. I like what you said about um they're doing the best they can with what they have. Exactly. And especially for immigrants who have left everything but also having a lack of access to education, right? equitable education, right? Or growing up in rural areas of the world. Right. How often are they talking about sexuality and about queerness? And it's just so fascinating also where there are these ideologies, homophobia as an ideology, right? Right. Uh, is also very popular in certain areas and it becomes right. a facet of what people learn and I think for me too, kind of same boat where it's just not the best relationship with my mother when it comes to queerness. My father passed away when I was young, but also very militant. And I'm like, Mm. I think my mom's cooler about it, but I could tell my father, like, especially with men in an Asian household. Oh yeah. Right. There's this whole, like, it's homophobic, but also there's something about like issues with gender as well. Right. It's misogyny. Misogyny. It's yeah. misogyny. Yeah. Because they think gay is feminine and you can't be feminine, right? So. Yes. Yes. Right. It, it, there's so many layers to it where it's also to be Asian here in America, you have to be almost as like macho, hyper masculine individual, right? And it's, it's so many layers of unpacking and. I've found that as a part of just like reconciling and doing all this is healing, not just for you, but also healing for your parents and so many layers Mm -hmm. of things that were passed down to them that they didn't even get to choose. Right. Yeah. You know, that is a conversation. I feel like if, I feel like I, if I ask them like what our relationship has like taught them, I think the, I don't know if they had words beyond like, oh, you helped me open my world up to more ideas. But even that, mm-hmm. that's a huge step for like immigrant parents. Yeah. So many layers unpack, you know, where it's, it's parents immigrating here thinking, having a plan in their mind, right? This future right. that they think that they're going to get, but also you're instilled this whole concept of a nuclear family and this heterosexual nuclear family. And right. it's just so, we talk about this in other spaces too, where it's just, mm-hmm. you might be the actual salvation that they've been seeking because this is exactly what was almost like meant to happen. Right. To give them this lesson in life that, you know, some people who believe in karmic destinies and future, this karmic destiny and this future of bringing this together was maybe what was meant to happen to right yeah yeah i think they need i think they needed a, a drag queen child yeah um i <laughs> i exactly. actually i was a i was an accident i <laughs> i was an accident <laughs> they didn't plan to have me oh yeah. really yeah yeah my mom still won't my mom still won't i mean it, it makes it makes even better. Exactly. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, now it makes sense, right? Like when you yeah. put it, bring it up to like karmic destiny, it's yeah, like you know, yeah, yeah. I yeah, like it's yeah. what needed to happen, right? Yeah. And like my my mom had my sister who's 12 years older than me, my brother four years later, eight years older than me, yeah. had another was pregnant four years after my brother was born, miscarriage. Yeah. Four years later, they thought she thought she was done trying, mm. had me. Yeah. Mm, maybe it was all exactly what was meant to happen. Yeah. And yeah, I wonder that that could be an interesting conversation. Yeah. She will never admit it. I knew it was, I was an accident. <laughs> but now accident no more. It was fate. No. Yeah. I think, I think that's beautiful. And it's something that for a lot of folks who also listen to this podcast, And we have folks listening overseas as well. And I think there's this very important 
dialogue about this, about the intersection of queerness and Asianness and culture and also homophobia and mm-hmm. queerphobia, gender, sexuality. And I, I think a lot of shared experiences is very similar to this, right? Where it's navigating and doing a lot of this heavy lifting. And I'm sure a lot of your education facilitating these situations in a context, right, and in a job. And I'm sure right. a lot of the patience is also culminated into what you're able to experience today, too. Right. Yeah. It was hard, but it was worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm I'm curious, um, as we're starting to get to the end of our podcast, um, do you have any lessons, any takeaways that you want our listeners in part uh i feel like i provided a lot already but i guess yeah i guess one thing i will say is that if you're if we're going back to drag Mm. go for it don't be afraid to be crunchy Mm. if it in any terms of any type of art form fill your cup whenever inspiration hits follow it and i think that when Mm. when inspiration hits and you don't act on it, Mm -hmm. not that you always have to act on everything, but you know, I, sometimes it's a disservice to yourself to not allow yourself the freedom to do what your heart really wants. You know, sometimes obviously we can't because of time Mm -hmm. and capacity and whatnot. But on the other side of that, there is so much, so much healing you can do and so much that you didn't know that you could provide to others by doing what you love and presenting your authenticity. I will also say if you're starting drag, there's so much that you can work with in terms of like how you express yourself, how you celebrate your heritage, every person's experience as as a Asian American, Asian diasporic, your experiences are different and you deserve to celebrate and explore all of that. For me, Asian, my Asian American experience isn't necessarily tied to just doing traditional wear, isn't just tied to doing lip sync songs that my, uh, we, my parents did Mm -hmm. for karaoke growing up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also things that were very Asian American to me, to me that a lot of that is anime because those were, guess what, my role models. Mm. And so a lot of that is while Pokemon, yes, is Asian and isn't inherently something that is like for for Asians, you know, that is something that was a big part of my yeah. growing up, you know, that was a part of my Asian American experience. Um, and so that's, you know, I continue to celebrate that today. That's beautiful. Yeah. What is a few more questions really quick? Um, something that's bringing you joy lately? Um, what is something that's bringing me joy lately? So I also play a lot of TFT. Uh, <laughs> do, do, are you familiar with Team Fight Tactics? It's a uh, it's a uh, it's a spinoff game of League of Legends. No, I uh, I haven't gotten too much into it, but lately I've been getting into Pal World. <laughs> you got Pal World? <laughs> yeah, it's like Pokemon with guns. As a Pokemon <laughs> lover, how, I do you? How do you feel about it? Um, literally, it's just. It stole Pokemon. It's like they just literally stole so many things about Pokemon. They stole mm-hmm. a lot of stuff from Zelda. Mm-hmm. They, it's just like all these Nintendo games and they just threw it together. And it's just, uh-huh. there's no lore or storyline, but it's just like all the mechanics. I think if they layer in the storyline, uh-huh. it's just, I think people have just been like, this is literally what people, especially Pokemon fans, have been asking for for right. decades and decades. Yeah. Right. Well, let's see if Game Freak will give us something somewhat similar (laughs) for the upcoming game for ZA. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Because, I mean, yeah, for Legends Arceus, like, that was the... I love that game so much. I thought it was... When I played it, I was like, wow, I can't believe this is a Pokemon game. The way there was so much life Mm -hmm. into every single Pokemon animation and interaction. And, yeah, I'm like, I wish I could experience that game newly again for the first time. (laughs) I think other things that are bringing me joy, like I said, I started learning how to draw Mm -hmm. and you'll get a kick out of this. I specifically started learning how to draw to, to be a fake artist. Oh yeah. So to, to draw my own Pokemon, which is something I've always wanted to do as a kid. Yeah. And so, and I will say this to all of our audience members, if there's something you want to do as a kid, but you never got to do it, do it now. Yeah. 
don't wait. Just do it. It'll be fun. It'll be healing. Oh, yeah. I love that. Um, do you know, fun fact, do you know how they make Pokemon? Like, what is some of the artistic rule of how they like create new Pokemon? Uh, a few in terms of theory. I've watched so many Sugimori art style videos. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, if I don't yeah. have anything playing, I'm playing like a four artists try to draw yeah. Pokemon from the same description. Yeah, like, yeah. I'm like, I'm watching one of those. Shout out to those YouTubers. True Green. I love you. <laughs> but yeah, I like, I think one of the things is that one, it should be a complex simplicity is how I like to put it because you cannot over design a Pokemon. Yeah. Otherwise, it looks like it's either a Neopet or a Digimon. Mm -hmm. One, it has to be somewhat, it has to be relatively simple. There has to be some sort of concept that is there, but not over there mm -hmm. in a sense. So it's a very fine balance. I specifically try to study and emulate like the quote quote Pokemon art style that Sugi Mori has. Not the Gen 1 and 2, like the watercolor stuff, but like yeah. really Gen 3, 4 and on that kind of style. Because I feel like that's what we kind of see more of now. And so mm -hmm. eventually... What I read... Yeah. Yeah, what were you saying? Oh, I was just going to say, I was like, eventually I want, I'm, I have a whole region that I'm like brainstorming. And so when, once I'm, once I feel like I am ready to release my works, I have works in progress and I have some stuff I feel more somewhat satisfied with, but I'm still working on it. Yeah. Ooh, that would be exciting to see. The thing I watched on YouTube and it was a theory, but basically the artist for Game Freak apparently the whole lore around like, who's that Pokemon, right? And they had the silhouette is they would actually silhouette everyone's Pokemon and your silhouette actually couldn't look like another Pokemon. And that was one of the tests that they would do mm. to ensure that that's how they were all differentiated uh -huh. was a silhouette of it. Yeah. And then it turned into lore around the who's that Pokemon right. thing because they were already doing that right. as an activity to vet the Pokemon. Oh, I didn't hear about that, actually. That's something good to know. It's also very hard to make a silhouette look extremely similar to one another unless you really copy, unless you copy and paste. Mm -hmm. You know, in the, in the new Netflix Pokemon series where it's not Ash anymore, there's no more who's that Pokemon. It's really sad. No. I also didn't know there was a Netflix series. Yeah, it's uh, it's like in the Paldea region. There, it follows new protagonists. What? Yeah, there's I'm so. Yeah, no, I watched it religiously as a kid. Yeah, I binged. I binged it like with my boyfriend, like literally, like a day or, or two. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna add this to my list. Yeah. Pokemon Joy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then next question, what are some of your upcoming projects you have coming up in this year? What are some of my upcoming projects? Well, Send Nudes is constantly doing shows. Um, so follow at Send Nudes Party. That's Send N-O-O-D-Z Party, like noodles. Get your head out the gutter. It's We constantly have parties. Uh, check out our pride parties if this is coming up with them if they haven't passed already as well as we have events every month or so at the time of this recording we are doing regular drag dim sums in eagle rock in the la area so if you are in the area and want to come through have some good dim sum while seeing drag queens perform in the back of a restaurant come through it's fun Otherwise, upcoming projects, and just follow me to see what's up. I don't know what's happening in the next few months. That's, <laughs> I don't know what's past June. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess follow-up question, where can listeners follow you? Uh, I am at Miss Shumai on all social media, M-I-S-S-S-H-U-M-A-I. If you type in M-I-S-S -S with another S at the end, Sugar Cane from Drag Race will come up first, and I'm usually the second one. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yes, come through SEO. <laughs> yeah. And uh, really appreciated having you on this episode. I think we had a lot of discussions just around drag, Asian, queer communities. And for folks listening, if you've enjoyed this episode with Miss Shumai, uh, definitely leave us a rating review. This is how our friends discover episodes. And follow us at Yellow Glitter Pod on social and give us your thoughts and recommendations of what you want to see more of. 
And for full episodes, transcripts, and show notes, you can visit us on our website at yellowglitterpodcast.com. And I just want to thank you, Ms. Shumai, for showing up and sharing your story. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And so thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It means a lot. And it's great to connect with you. And thank you to all of the listeners for uh, listening to my stories. Keep supporting drag. Support your local drag scenes. Support your local Asians. Email your senators. Go to protests and stuff. <laughs> Get out there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, can I shout yes. out one more thing that I forgot that I work on? <laughs> yes. So, yeah, one of the other things that I work on consistently is I host a lot of K-pop events in uh, L.A. So follow me at Miss Shumai if you want to attend some K-pop events. I perform a lot of K-pop numbers. Uh, and we also always have random play dance, meaning that if you know the dances, you get to come on out and celebrate yourself too. So yes. yeah. Good play dance is so good. <laughs> Are you a K-pop fan? I love K-pop. <laughs> who who's who what, who's your ultimate? Um, well, it's just like new jeans. I love new jeans, but they're so overrated. Of course. But I've been actually very into T-pop lately. Thai pop. Oh my god! And I'm gonna send you. I'm gonna send you a list. But the Thai girlies. Oh yeah. Are like they're coming through. Oh yeah. With it's like K-pop from back in the day, where it's like experimental, interesting music. They have like, it's just so. I'm just like everyone on K-pop land. I've just been like raving. I'm like T-pop. Like you have to check it out. It's just like. Oh yeah. It's they're like killing yeah. it right now one yeah. of the one of the girlies that i saw recently i think their group name is called empress yeah yeah they're yeah, yeah. they're really 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 good i follow a group called mix fruit they're another thai pop group too oh yes mx fruit yes no i'm upset they're like they're like not that big yet but they're amazing <laughs> they're amazing they had like this sad ass song like last year at some point and i that was on repeat for a while yeah no, they're, they're so all of their good. songs are so good. I play them and everyone's like, oh my God, they're so good. I'm like, yes. I, I don't know. I don't know anyone who's known them. That's amazing. Oh yeah. I love them. I love them. Wait, is it MX Fruit or is it not? Is it not Mix Fruit? I've been saying MX Fruit. I don't know. I should know. Yeah. But it's, no, they, all the girls look so uniquely different from each other, but they work so well together and they're just so cute. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, yeah. I am obsessed. Do you know who PP Crit is? No. You don't know who PP Crit is? Okay. My straight roommate kept this queer icon, this queer tie icon for me for so long. But like for what? me, I saw PP Crit and I was like, this is, why am I getting gender envy? Because this is like, it, this it's, it is like, he, he is like femme twink sensual icon that is like i've never seen this in like a yeah. in like a pop star before mm. and i'm like i feel so seen i uh, i like uh, yeah okay added yeah i'm like how, th okay. i'm like i i know this is thailand's most sought after bottom like this is crazy <laughs> oh yes you heard it here, folks. You heard it here first. <laughs> well, thank you for being on the podcast. And for listeners, thank you for listening. And hope to be with you again for our next episode. Bye now.